Today we're going to look at the symbolism, imagery, and themes in William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. So let's look at what it is we're about to cover. With the symbols and imagery, we're going to look at Thesis and Hippolyta. We'll look at the love potion, uh, the mechanicals play. We're going to look at light versus dark and night versus day. The moon is a great symbol. And of course, the idea of the reality in the play versus the illusions that are given. The themes, well, it's a Midsummer Night's Dream, so we have to talk about love and several different themes from love, the difficulty of love, the contrasts of love, and love being out of balance. And it also being Midsummer Night's Dream, we're going to have to talk about the magic and, of course, about the dreams that are represented. So let's start off with our symbols and imagery. Well, Theseus and Hippolyta appear in the daylight at both the beginning and the end of the play's action. They, however, disappear for the duration of the action, leaving in the middle of Act 1, Scene 1, and not reappearing until Act 4, as the sun is coming up to end the magical night in the forest. Now, Theseus and Hippolyta, the ruler of Athens and his warrior bride, are used to represent the order and stability, in contrast with the uncertainty, instability, and darkness of most of the rest of the play. So as Thesis and Hippolyta come in at the beginning, they're going to represent the order and reality that most people watching Shakespeare's play in his time would understand. And as soon as they leave, all bets are off. Welcome to Magic and Dreams. Now, as we talk about magic and dreams, one of the different symbols and imagery that we have is with the love potion. Now, the love potion is used by fairies to wreak romantic habit throughout Acts 2, 3, and 4. Now, because the meddling fairies are careless with the love potion, the situation of the young Athenian lovers becomes increasingly chaotic and confusing. After all, Demetrius and Lysander are magically compelled to transfer their love from Hermia to Helena. And Titania is hilariously humiliated because she's magically compelled to fall deeply in love with the ass-headed bottom. Now, the love potion thus becomes a symbol of the unreasoning, fickle, erratic, and undeniably powerful nature of love because love can lead to inexplicable and bizarre behaviors, and usually it can't be resisted. So a lot of times Shakespeare would put a play within a play, and we're going to take a look at the Mechanicals play in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Now this play within a play is used to represent in condensed form many of the important ideas and themes of the main plot. Now because your craftsmen are such bumbling actors, their performance satirizes a melodramatic Athenian lover and gives the play a purely joyful and almost comedic ending. So in your play, Pyramus and Thisbe face parental disapproval in the play within a play, just as Hermia and Lysander do. And the theme of romantic confusion enhanced by the darkness of night is rehashed, as Pyramus mistakenly believes that Thisbe's been killed by the lion, just as the Athenian lovers experience intense misery because of the mix-ups that are caused by the fairies meddling. So the craftsman's play is therefore a kind of symbol for A Midsummer Night's Dream itself, which is also a story involving powerful emotions that's made hilarious by its comical presentation. Next, when we look at the idea of light versus dark or day versus night. Now, with all of the plots and characters and conflicts in the play Midsummer Night's Dream, they're all clearly driven by the notion of contrast, specifically with the idea of light versus dark. So when we take a look and brainstorm a few of the events that occur in the two places, when we think of light or day, we think of order. This is at the very beginning of the play and in Act 4 when we see, uh, when we see the, the king and queen come out with his warrior princess. That sense of order is there in the daylight. The sense of structure and rules and rigidity. We see the craftsmen as they are coming in and trying to get together and figure out what it is that they need to do. All this proper and respectable behavior of the lovers before the fairies start meddling, all of this happens usually within the light or the day. But as we start going into darker forests, as the night starts to fall, as we are starting to wander through the woods, you see chaos, you see a lack of structure and rules, you see flexibility and, of course, bizarre and illicit behavior. The moon is represented in several places here. Now, the moon usually symbolizes love, 
lust, and dreaming, and is seen as a powerful symbolic force that determines and affects human behavior and reactions. So the meaning of the moon is never static. It means different things to each character, depending upon his or her present situation or the character attributes. Remember, most of the play is done in this chaotic, illusionary kind of nighttime. And so the moon, being that one light that shines through, it has different meanings to each character, depending upon their present situation. Now, the moon is not only a luminous passive watcher in the night sky, it's a powerful force. It has an intoxicating effect on all of the characters and for some reason seems to incite bizarre and illicit behavior out of all of them. Now, it's also worth mentioning that the moon can be a force of treachery and destruction. Even though an errant fairy like Puck is just a harmless troublemaker, the fact remains that he exists to mislead the night wanderers. Now, it is easy to view Puck in a positive light, but the dark creatures and intentions lurk under the cover of night. So the unsavory ambitions by the supernatural creatures like Puck might only be helped by the moon-intoxicated susceptibility of human prey. It's as if the moon is a drug which renders the characters into a dreamlike state, and then the fairies now can rule over them in the night. We can also see the ideal of reality versus illusion. Now, Shakespeare will balance reality and illusion when he mingles romances between uh, the characters, uh, the different problems that continually arise, and then, of course, the actions between the mortals and the spirits who are messing with them. Now, in the realm of illusion, notice several elements in which logic is suspended in favor of symbolism, as in perhaps our own dreams. Now, Puck describes his own helpful and harmful behavior as if it's all logically consistent. Puck is never shown as a good guy or a bad guy because he has both helpful and harmful behavior. Now, are the fairies large or tiny? Because we can see that Titania embraces Bottom, so eventually she must be the size of Bottom, the, uh, the, the, the carpenter. And so are they big or are they small here? Where is the reality and where is the illusion? We also have to ask, do the spirits fly around the globe with the night, or do they watch the dawn and have diminished powers during the day? Why do they only come out and use their powers at night? Now, with Midsummer Night's Dream likes to break the theatrical illusion, the rule that the players do not talk to the audience about this being a play. Now, Oberon begins by saying, I am invisible with the play within a play, and it's interrupted several times by explanations by the actors. So usually in the theatrical illusion, players or actors do not talk to the audience. And with our play within a play, there's lots of talking going on. Uh, in Shakespeare, even asides are unusual, though he uses prologues as modern movies may begin with text or voiceovers giving the background. So this is very much breaking the theatrical illusion. Now, the amateur actor's concern about the lion frightening the ladies probably refers to an episode in which actors who were to impersonate lions were omitted from the James of Scotland's parade out of fear of frightening the audience. Now, the actors decided the lion must be played to the half mask so people will realize it's really a person. And even then, the actors step out of their invisibility and actually start explaining uh, their, their thoughts and feelings to the people watching. So where is the reality in all of this Midsummer Night's Dream? Well, the key passage in the play is Theseus' speech on the lunatic, the lover, and the poet in Act 5. People can hallucinate. Lovers see ugly people as beautiful, and poets create an imaginary world to give a life to ideas. Otherwise, Shakespeare says, giving to airy, nothing, a local habitation, and a name. Now, fear can even make a normal person in dim light mistake a bush for a bear, so that sense of reality is there, but it could easily be overturned. So when we look at the idea of where's the reality versus the illusion, let's check out some of these lines specifically from the beginning of the play. Aegeus accuses Lysander of being insincere and using evil magic to win Hermia's love, but actually, it's Aegeus who's fantasizing about it. Now, Hermia says, I wish my father looked but with my eyes, to which Theseus replies, well, rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. Well, no two people can see the world in the same way. Now, Helena knows Demetrius is a jerk and says he has a bad taste in women, but Helena loves him anyway. Now, she reflects on love's blindness and sudden changeability. 
Demetrius remains under the influence of the love juice, remarks after talking with Theseus in the woods, that he doesn't know what he dreamed and what really happened. And then Theseus says that even the best theatrical pro productions are shadows, and that imagination can amend or repair a bad play, so it seems good. Now, notice that Theseus is himself a character in a play. And at the very end, in Act 5, Puck invites the audience to believe that if they didn't like the play, it was just a dream. But can we blend reality and illusion together? You can, and that's known as a paradox. So in A Midsummer Night's Dream, imagination makes impossible things into reality. After all, Theseus is wooing Hippolyta with his sword. Remember, they had fought first, and now they are lovers. So on opposite sides in battle, they fall in love, and enemies become friends. These are mismatched lovers, just like in the play within the play, the families of Pyramus and Thisbe. Now, Helena's affection for Demetrius seems to make him hate her. But Hermia's hatred seems to make him love her. Another paradox in the dream world of the forest, deer chase tigers as Helena pursues Demetrius. And like Demetrius's whipped spaniel, Helena grows fonder from his mistreatment. Other paradoxes, Pyramus is white as a lily and red as a rose. How can that happen? Well, Theseus and Hippolyta, describing the hunt with the hounds sounding random, discordant notes, celebrate the wild and free beauty of chaos. And then, of course, our play within a play is a tragical mirth, merry and tragical, tedious and brief. Now let's move on to the themes of love, magic, and dreams. Let's start off by breaking down love into more of, its more of its parts. For starters, with the difficulty of love. There's romantic tension and social etiquette between Lysander and Hermia. After all, their parents don't want them to be together. There's outside interventions that are keeping them apart. We also have the betrayal of lovers and friends. Hermia and Helena, who are friends, all of a sudden find themselves in different love triangles. Lysander and Hermia, Demetrius and Helena, Titania and Oberon, all of these triangles are, are becoming because of love juice and, of course, from the other just difficulties of getting along with the first person. And, of course, once all these love triangles come along, the sense of jealousy comes in between Oberon and Titania and, of course, between Helena and Hermia. Now, when it comes to contrast and love, we think, why are they together? We have Titania and Bottom. We have Bottom and the lovers in the play. We have Oberon and Puck, and the dedication levels of lovers to one another. After all, you're just kind of questioning, why are these people together? Is it the love potion? Were they meant to be? Why are they even helping one another out? Where is love out of balance? Well, Pyramus and Thisbe parallel real life for Lysander and, Thermi and, and Hermia, where we have two lovers who are not allowed to be together because of outside interventions. And in the woods, the lovers are out of balance of the normal states of love. They're not together, and therefore they're going to find themselves out of balance. Our next theme we'll look at is magic. Now, the fairy's magic brings about many of the most bizarre and hilarious situations in the play. Now, in the play, this magic embodies the almost supernatural power of love that is symbolized by the love potion and begins to create a surreal world. Now, although the misuse of magic causes chaos, as when Puck mistakenly applies the love potion to Lysander's eyelids, magic ultimately resolves the play's tensions by restoring love to the balance among the quartet of Athenian youths. And then our last theme with dreams. I've had a dream past the wit of man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if he goes about to expound this dream. And that's from bottom. Now, as the title suggests, dreams are an important theme in A Midsummer Night's Dream. They're linked to the bizarre magical mishaps in the forest. Now, Hippolyta's first words in the play evidence the prevalence of dreams. She says, four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. Now the theme of dreaming recurs predominantly when the characters attempt to explain bizarre events in which these characters are involved. For example, I've had a dream past the wit of man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if you go to expound this dream. 
Now, Bottom says this as he's unable to fathom the magical happenings that have affected him as anything but the result of him sleeping and dreaming. Well, there are your themes, your imagery, and your symbols from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, if you liked what you saw, please uh, like the, the video. And if you could consider subscribing to my channel, that would be great. If you'd like to see more about Midsummer Night's Dream or other Shakespearean plays, if you have any other comments about this particular section, don't forget the comment sections are below. Thanks for stopping by.